Praise God and welcome back to Grace Online. I'm Pastor Lachey. Privileged and honored to be with you this day, the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We are in a series this summer um, during the month of July around developing and growing deeper family ties. We started this year out with a focus on being deeper and determined, more determined to please God and to become everything that God desires for us to be. And if you've been tracking with us as a member of the Grace family, or maybe even as just an extended family member in the body of Christ, you know that this message is for you. It's for families. It's for some foundational elements on what it takes for families to succeed, but also what's the, what's the impetus behind family? Why did God choose families to populate the earth? Think for a moment, God could have created Adam and Eve over and over and over again, but God started out the entire ball rolling with um, Adam and Eve being the foreparents of all humanity. And he said to them to be fruitful and to multiply and to subdue the earth and occupy until it comes. And so we have uh, an obligation, um, but we also have an identity in the family of God. And we'll get into that in the scriptures in just a moment. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for another day. We thank you for your grace and mercy today. We thank you for this point in the year in which we're able to reflect on the months past, but also looking forward to the months ahead, knowing that you are the author and the finisher of our faith. We invite you here to illuminate your word and open our hearts and minds to receive the wisdom of your word and even the kingdom elements that come in sharing the Bible. Father, I thank you for the family of God worldwide. Thank you for the people of grace and the people who are affiliated with those people, Father. It's our mission to reach as many people as possible, the different people of the world, by teaching these biblical principles and life application of scriptures. We believe there's hope in you, Father. So let that be revealed in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, I want to go to some scripture, but I wanted to kind of touch base on last week. Um, I had an interview with, with, with the kids, the grandkids. That was fun and exciting. But later um, that day, I was able to share the word of the Lord regarding the foundations for looking at deeper ties. Um, I mentioned or I asked the question rhetorically, why is it important to understand our ties to family or to understand the significance of family? Well, when God created the heavens and the earth, everything that he intended to accomplish, he wagered it on family. He wagered it on Adam and Eve, one man, one woman, and he said to them, that they were to be fruitful and multiply. The descendants of those two individuals eventually began to populate the earth. And I think we picked up where we talk about Isaac and his family and um, how when he was given instructions to get out from his kindred and to go, um, there's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, when we get to Isaac, he, he was the son of Abraham. Abraham was instructed to separate somewhat from his family and to take the family unit that he was responsible for into the promised land. I shared on Sunday that Isaac gets into the promised land, but he's given instructions um, for his sons not to marry within the population of people that were there in the promised land because God wanted to do something specific. He gave them more instruction to go and marry from his family line. And, and that was a general practice and still is in some places in the East. Um, but the reason for that was that God was attempting to create not just an ethnicity, not an ethnic group of people. God was looking to create covenant, to strike covenant with humanity once again, because the covenant had been broken from Adam and Eve's fall. And then we find that later God made covenant with Noah that he wouldn't destroy the earth again. But God is all about constantly making covenants. And one of the covenantal institutions that God has established in the earth is family. Family. And family is not just a mom and a dad and some children. Family extends beyond just the typical definition that we oftentimes look at in storybook cases. But then there's also those who've perverted the definition of family and they've extended it beyond that which God ever even planned. So I wanna talk about the three ways that families exist. And then I'll give you some biblical support for that. There are three ways. There's families that are based on birth, meaning someone is born into a family or families, a husband and wife gets together and have children and then those children are born. And, and that's family, that's blood family. You have then siblings, brothers and sisters. Um, by virtue of you being born to that set of parents, you have multiple sets of grandparents and great grandparents and great great grandparents and they all have parents and grandparents and great great grandparents. And so when you think about it, I was um, reading somewhere, it's literally maybe about three to four thousand people involved in just you getting here um, if we go all the way back because 
everybody came from a family or is a part of a biological family. The second identity for family is adoptive families, when you are adopted into the family. Um, the scriptures, which we'll cover today, deal with adoption, but it's not like we would think. Now, remember, you can't choose to be born into a family, but someone can choose to have you adopted into their family. And God illustrates that quite well in the way that he engrafted us. Um, we, of course, are born again, but when we were born again, we were born again into the adoption of the Father, God the Father, through His Son, Jesus Christ, which makes Him our elder brother. If you can see, there's still this family theme, this family structure in God's overall redemptive plan. And then the third way that we can identify or that we can be recognized as family is through our spiritual connection to the people of God, our spiritual connection. By virtue of the adoption, we were all adopted, those who've accepted Christ as their Savior, which means that we not only inherited it, the family of God based on Jesus Christ being his son, but also all of the other people in the world that are affiliated as children of God, which means that our family exponentially grows from being an earthly family or an adoptive family to this spiritual family. And so I want to show you some things in the scripture that helps us to understand the importance, the significance, or even the deference that we should give to those three types of family. They're all important and significant. I mean, if you think about it, without a biological family or biological happenings, you wouldn't even be here. We wouldn't even be here. You wouldn't be having this conversation. Um, you know, somebody says, will you be looking from the other side? I don't know what the other side is like. You, you definitely had to have come here through a family. You had to come here through the biological process of an egg and the fertilization of that egg from the female to the male's seed. And the biology is, is quite plain and evident. Um, there is no other way that we've been created is other, other than through those biological elements. People don't just grow like pods in the, in the field or people don't grow like fruit on the trees. What happens is that God's miraculous power goes into motion at the inception of his thoughts toward you. He even says in the scripture that before he formed us in our mother's womb, he knew us, which means that we were in the mind of God prior to our physical existence. So the biological part is just an inevitable step of getting us here. We didn't get to choose it. We didn't get to choose the ethnicity. We didn't get to choose the uh, family of origin. We didn't get to choose the geographic location. We didn't get to choose any of those things, but we were not being denied the opportunity, one, to be in the earth, but two, to manifest in ways that we can't even comprehend, which means that when he made us and he put us in those families, it was for a reason, it was for purpose. He made me black, he made someone else white or someone else Latino, so that we could be fully the plan, the purpose, the intent of what he had considered in his mind before we brought us here. Think about the timing of our arrival. I was reading also um, a little bit of science behind this that every girl is born with all of the eggs in her already that she will ever produce, which means that every potential child is in her. Every man is born with the, the reproductive system to produce the seed that would fertilize every egg that is in the woman. Now, God doesn't choose to fertilize every egg and God doesn't choose to use every seed. In fact, the Bible um, is very replete about how he was intentional and, and made us reverentially. That's what fearfully and wonderfully made means. But think about the science that there were uh, close to 8 million um, sperm cells that, that actually were sent to fertilize the egg, but only one of them made it. One of them made it. And it's interesting because even if you're a twin, it was one and it split. So think for a moment about the fact that God has a one-tracked mind concerning you. God has a one-track mind concerning family, and God can't be toyed with or negotiated with as to what we would try to think family is to be or deny the birthright or the birth identity of the natural family. And then in addition to the natural family, the adoption of which he adopts us as his sons and his daughters is such a privilege. I was going to say a bonus. It's, it's such a privilege and an honor to be adopted into the family of God that words hardly express that identity because when you know we, we say things like he's done so much for me i cannot tell it all or you know i get overwhelmed and i can't say a word think for a moment about the magnitude of how god chose us specifically to come into the family of god sometimes people will make the mistake of saying oh we are all god's children we are all not god's children because some people choose not to be a part of the family of god 
You think about the elements of a natural family and how significant it is that that family bonds and that that family connects and that there is the protector and the priest and the provider of that family accompanied, of course, by a nurturer and a fruitful vine that supports the concept of growing a family. I just described to you a mother and a father or a husband and a wife and, and what we call as the institutional family. Now, there are other dynamics that also help that to succeed in that there are support systems and then there are siblings and then there are offspring from the offspring and the offspring's offspring until where the family begins to become a magnanimous creative tapestry of God's expression. So if your last name is Smith or Jones or, or Lachey or whatever, all of that bloodline or all of those people in that family clan or unit are a reflection, a combined reflection of what God is intending to get into the earth. So, so family is a whole lot deeper than just, oh, those are my people, or I'm just related to those folks. Time and togetherness plays a part in the identity of a family and a family's um, ability to stand, nurturing, love, communication. These are all attributes that God possesses and he puts those in us when he puts us in a family. No one is an island according to the scriptures. So even if someone is orphaned or someone um, unfortunately through, through unfortunate mishaps or events has no living relatives, there is the option of God's adoption, the option of God's adoption. I know that sounds a little poetic, but I want to share this with you. Scripture in Galatians, the fourth chapter, I'm going to read from the King James Version. Uh, Galatians, the fourth chapter, verses four through seven says this. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman under the law, to redeem that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Verse six says, and because you are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, or whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more servants, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Now, I think about how this is written timely in a timely manner to the Galatians who were people that by tradition were paganistic. They were not Israelites. They were not Hebrew. They were not in covenant with God. They were outside of the Abrahamic covenant or Noah's covenant with, with, with God and the people of God, his offspring. These people were outside of what we would know as the natural order of birthright. But God extends this love to them, us, you, and me, born Israelite or not. He, he extends this love to us, and he shows us through commitment of his word that through his only begotten son, we shall obtain or inherit sonship, or we become adopted family members. The unique thing about adopted children, as I said, they're chosen and they're selected. They didn't get to choose. They, they were selected. And by virtue of agreeing with the selection, they then submit themselves to this parenthood or this covering of a father. God is so loving and, and, and kind toward his children that when he adopts us, he makes us just as um, uh, rightful or we have the exact same rights as his dear son. Which means that in God's family, there's no blood versus non-blood. There are no stepchildren. There are no half-brothers and sisters. There are no in-laws or outlaws. Think for a moment about how when we became inherited children of God through the adoptive process, we then began to identify immediately with Jesus as our brother. He's our savior, but he's also our brother, firstborn, the firstborn of many brethren, according to what the scripture says. He's the firstborn among the dead. He's the first and only given sacrifice for us. John 3.16 is the most recited and the most memorable scripture that there is historically, that God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes on him will not perish but have everlasting life. And, and really in those few verses are the implications of sonship. The everlasting life is what affords us the sonship. His sons and his daughters are entitled by virtue of Jesus' sacrifice, his blood, to have eternal and everlasting life. I'm really taken by what the, the book of Ephesians says, I, I, as, I, as I read this over and over again, I've read it many, many times, um, just in passing or reading, preaching from other verses around this, that we are the children of God. John said it like this, beloved, 
Now we are the sons of God, but it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Which means that the revelation of who we are as sons and daughters is still unfolding. The revelation of who we are as joint heirs with Christ Jesus, it's very explicit in the scripture. But the question is, can we obtain that to the ability to understand the significance of this? Can we attain in our minds that we are children of God? And as children of God, we represent our father and we represent our, our kinship. Now you say, well, who's the mother? Who's the mother? Some people argue and debate that mother nature or the earth is the mother. I would say that the bride of Christ is considered the mother of us all in that the bride, we're the church. The church is the nurturing um, unit in which God put in the earth. So that means, yes, we do need to interface with the church. Yes, we do need to assemble ourselves together. Yes, we do need correction and reproving, but encouragement and, and enthusiasm of fellowship, those are the elements of the family of God. So as children of God, we're no longer under bondage. It says in the third verse of that same chapter, even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world when we were not the children of God, but the children of this world. The Bible says that if the gospel is hid, is hid to those who are lost, who the God of this world has blinded the minds and eyes of those who don't believe. So we were children of darkness. We walked in darkness, we lived in darkness, but in the fullness of time, he raised us up together to sit with Christ in heavenly places. When we embrace that, what happens is that we begin to develop an identity that lets us know who we are, we're affirmed. One of the greatest challenges facing individuals today is lack of identity or a case of mistaken identity because of us not really knowing who we are, not knowing who our fathers are, um, earthly as well as spiritually. So that third type of family orientation is the spiritual orientation of being connected to this force, this spiritual body that is invisible by nature, but it's very, very strong in the spirit realm. It exists. So I'm not talking about denominational segments of people or just small groups that represent quote unquote populaces within a, a church building, but think of the whole family of God. Think of everybody who ever lived, who's ever living, and who ever will live in the future that are the children of God of which we're connected to. Is that by happenstance? Is that by accident? Is it coincidental? And are there opportunities for us to connect as family members. The word nepotism is um, rooted in the idea or the concept of family secession or family favor or family privilege. And it's not a negative word. It was used in early dynasties of uh, nepotistic uh, values in which the kingdom was passed on to the offspring of those who were of royal descent, which means that it stayed in the family. As part of the family of God, that third definition of family that I gave you, we have a nepotistic situation here. God's desire is to give to you the kingdom. God's desire is for us to share in the royalty of sonship. God's desire is for us to be the kings and the queens or the princes of the kingdom of God in the earth. You see, the prince of the power of the air or the prince that works in darkness, the, the prince um, of Persia, according to scripture, and I'm getting eschatological here, um, those, those kingdoms will fall, but they will fall at the name of the one and only Son of Jesus, Son of God, which is Jesus Christ. The Bible says, there is no other name given unto us whereby we must be saved. And at the name of Jesus, every tongue must confess, and every knee shall bow, every tongue must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God our Father. When my daughter was little, I used to sing to her every night. And I sang to the boys too after a while. They outgrew it, of course, and they started singing back. So we was equal. But, but I would sing a song that I learned um, when I first accepted Christ. And it just simply says, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Um, and, it, and it edifies because it says, kings and kingdoms shall all pass away. But there is something about that name that name is Jesus. And everybody that is anybody in Christ knows that song. I encourage you to listen to songs that help us to identify our kingdom citizenship 
as sons and daughters of God. I'll continue in the study. I want to get into some of the drama associated with these early families and how we see the mirror of those things happening in our lives. There's no drama like family drama. When you stop and think about it, anything that has ever entertained you or irritated you had to do with family and family dynamics and the interactions of family. My prayer is that by obtaining this wisdom and insight, from the scripture regarding family that we can do a better job of representing the kingdom of God and the families of God in the earth. Let me pray for you and your family right now. If you could gather your family members around, if they're in the house with you, or if you're someplace where you can say, hey, 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 we're gonna get prayer. I wanna pray. I wanna pray for families that units that either blood related, adoptively related, but spiritually connected would be able to manifest the full promises. I wanna talk about those promises over the next couple of weeks, but I also want us to be sensitive and our hearts to be sensitized to the fact that when the word of God speaks to us, it comes to bring fullness and wholeness to us, where we were hurt in the past, where our families might've disappointed us or let us down. We may have even have familiar abuse, that's family abuse in some way in our past. But if any man or woman is in Christ, they become new creatures and old things pass away and all things are made new. And that's over and over again until the full redemption. One of my favorite scriptures I've been writing this year is that he cast not away your confidence, which has great recompense of reward, because he who has begun a good work in you, he is faithful to complete it even until the day of Jesus's return. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and the time that we have in your word. Thank you for these brief moments of revelation and truth, wisdom, inspiration, and insight. I pray that something said is ministering to the people that have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. I pray for families, the families that are gathering around, stilling themselves just for the moment to hear that the blessings of the Lord are upon them, that they too are a part of the body. They've accepted Jesus as their savior. Father, I pray for the heads of families. I pray for those who have the patriarchal and matriarchal responsibility of, of nurturing children and young people and others. I pray for those siblings who've had to support one another, even in life's transitions. I pray, Father, for those parents who time is spent and things didn't go the way that they thought or the way that it was supposed to go, but yet there's redemption in being part of the family of God. So I pray for restoration to start now. I pray for an open heaven that we would be able to receive everything you're pouring out upon us in these last days. I rebuke and bind the spirit of the enemy that would try to rehearse the past and try to bring people down or try to perpetuate the curses. We speak for the blessings and we call forth the blessings in generations to come forward in these generations that are alive now. We call for the gifts and the talents and the traits and attributes that you intended to be in the earth and to help to perpetuate your kingdom assignment in us as family members, Father. Bless us and we'll be blessed. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Listen, thanks for tuning in. Come out and see us. At one o'clock, we have a live worship experience here at Grace, and we want you to be a part of it this month. We'll be doing some other things with family. We had a taste fest. So it's some exciting things happening and a great time for you to be a part of the family of God. Until next time, God bless. Greetings, and thank you for tuning in to Grace Online. Thank you for making this your place of virtual worship today. We're so glad that you decided to choose us and speaking of choosing, I want to encourage you to choose Jesus today. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus, and that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So maybe you had a crossroads in your life and you feel like this is the day. I don't want to, I don't want to delay any, anymore. I don't want to wait till tomorrow. Today might be my last day. But while I have this chance, I'm going to choose Jesus. And if that's your decision, I want you to pray this prayer. In fact, you can repeat right after me and let's pray together. Let's bow our heads. Dear God, I believe in your son, Jesus Christ. And I believe you sent him to die for my sins. I know I am a sinner. And today I confess that I want to be saved. God, I believe you sent your son. I believe you also raised him from the dead to life. And I want to make the conscious decision to walk with Jesus from this day forward. I pray, God, that I will steward this season well. And I pray, oh God, that I will walk with clarity and I will walk with faith 
and I will walk believing that your son Jesus will never leave me or forsake me. And now at this moment, I know that I am saved and I will live eternally through your help. In your son Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you again for choosing grace. And if you prayed that prayer, send an email to info at gftnc.org and let us know your name, where you're from, and why you chose to follow Jesus today. We would love to get in touch with you. We would love to love on you, and we would love to hopefully see you one day here in the building at 3333 Craft. Thank you again, and here at Grace we always say, we believe there is hope. God bless.